Well, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show, episode number 281. That's 281. As per usual, if you listen to this podcast via the audio experience, please leave me a five-star review and share with your friends and family. If you're watching this via the YouTube app, smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment below. How's it going? Hmm? How's it going? Here we are, midweek session. For some of you, this is one of those weird hump day things. If you subscribe to the, oh, my feelings are really tied to the days of the week. And if it's not a certain day of the week, I'm not going to be happy. If you're in that kind of vibe, then I'm sure today is one of those helly moments for you where you're dreading waking up in the morning and going to work. But you know what? Rest assured, I am here to alleviate such pain. Just for a little brief moment, just to, you know, to kind of tie you over until the Thursday comes and the Friday comes and suddenly you can go out and get wasted and worry, you know, paint all your worries away and somehow get back to normality when you get back to work on Monday. But regardless of what it is, I'm happy you tune back in again. Um, it is now sometime in the evening, as you can spot from the background here. I'm not going to tell you exactly what time it is, but it's some quite late, you know. But, you know, we, we, we never rest. We never stop around here. We're just going to get it started. As per usual, um, if it's your first time around here, you'll know that, you know, this is the number one streetwear podcast in the world. For me, streetwear seems to encompass all, all things, you know, a bit of counterculture, a bit of overculture, a bit of underculture, a bit of culture within culture, but whatever it is. I find loads of cool, interesting topics on the internet. Gather all those links and talk about it with you lovely people over the interwebs. Sometimes via the audio experience, sometimes via the visual experience. But regardless, we're in this together, yeah? Mano a mano, yeah? Cool. Bless. So, in order to get things started, I thought there was no better way than to get things started than by uh, previewing this clip that I stumbled upon uh, featuring one Dave Rubin. And Larry King. Now, if you're familiar with Larry King, you'll know that he's a legendary talk show host, interviewee. You know, he sits down with people, asks some interesting questions, usually interesting people, if you like those kind of people. And you will also know that Dave Rubin is sort of like the de facto heir apparent, right? He's now got his own platform in the Rubin Report where he sits down with loads of interesting, colorful people who have someone on Twitter, a lot of people on Twitter don't really agree with his guest and they kind of paint him out to be some sort of white supremacist. But for the most part, Dave Rubin's all right, you know? He doesn't push his guests or kind of ask them too many questions sometimes because he doesn't want to and because it's his show he can do what he wants but i found this exchange incredibly funny especially when you give in the backdrop that dave rubin really looks up to larry king right of course he would right larry king is like 175 years old right if, if you're someone like dave rubin and you came up trying to become the next big tv host or interviewer you would obviously think larry king was your hero so to finally have him sitting across from you in your studio and for this to happen would just must have bro- absolutely broke his heart but for us to be in public, it was all too funny. So I quickly played this for you, but I'm sure some of you already seen it. And it's ringing right now. <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, hello. And you know what he did there, right? So he's he's sitting down with Dave Ruby if you're listening to your podcast. And he gets given a phone, a flip phone, by one of his assistants off camera. And obviously, it's something they had prearranged or something that he might have agreed with Ruben before the interview. Like, hey, I might get a phone call in the interview. Is okay if I take it, right? And of course, you say yes. So you're Larry King. Of course, you're going to say yes. But Larry King did, does that thing, right? That, um, that I've seen my dad do sometimes where when you're older, there's a thing where you just can't lie anymore. I think because you just because you just get older, you just give zero fucks. So your lying face is a bit, you got like a shit lying face. You're like, oh, I, I didn't know I had my phone in my hand. It's ringing. I had no idea. And so he's got that really horrible dad, <laughs> like, lying face on him, right? Look. Oh, shit. Hello. He opens it. And even when he opens it, you know he's used that phone a lot of times, right? He's, he's used that he's used that phone often. It's not like a new phone. It's just suddenly been thrust onto him. He's expecting a call. He knows it's going to come. And he just takes the phone call in the middle of the interview. <laughs> hey, Cannon, where are you? happening. <laughs> And then Ruben's looking at him like, what the fuck? I actually answered the phone call during my interview. And I can sympathize with something like this because I think, what's at play here? Even though we, no, it's a funny situation, I'm sure Ruben doesn't really mind about it, but it kind of speaks to, to the whole like power dynamic, isn't it? When it comes to these sort of things, like you probably get into this, right? To become your own boss, right? You probably get into the wonderful world of entertainment, wonderful world of YouTube to kind of, you know, run your own ship, right? To not be uh, told by the man, to not be given notes, right? To not be given feedback on your talking points or the topics on people that you want to invite. You want to run, you know, you want to run your own race. You want to be the captain of your own ship. Do your own thing. But then sometimes 
you get reminded of just where you fall on a totem pole or totem pole, right? Rather <laughs> of uh, seniority, experience, um, clout, whatever that word is, right? You get rem- you, sometimes you get an, a, a reminder, even if you're an independent contractor, you're an independent person, you have no boss, you know, David was doing his own thing, he doesn't have anyone to kind of answer to. But sometimes the universe tells you, hey, slap, slap. Don't get too big for your bridges, right? You think you're a big dog, but this is where your real level is actually at. Real, you know, Lever King probably rocked up to his studio late, right? Walking super slow, doing that old, weird, old man thing where he just repeats the same thing 70 million times, right? Taking his time with questions, then acting like he's cranky, falling asleep in the middle of the show, and then suddenly he answers his phone. It's like a reminder of like, hey, I'm still the big, I might be 175 years old, but I'm still the big dog, right? He's, hasn't he got like 17 wives or something, right? It's, he's only like six married or some shit. He's still getting married now at the age of 80. I don't know what's the point really, but Larry King's a legend, man. This whole exchange is incredible. Don't y'all look up <laughs> oh, you didn't have and then Ruben's like, he's giving him that, you know that face where you get, and you know, if you fast forward, well, I'll fast forward a bit, right? But he's doing that thing where like, hey man, look what's going on. Like, what, 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 this is not on. But if you fast forward it, he starts to accept the situation and he starts to take really constant, frequent sips of his drink from his can. It's just to kind of alleviate some of the pressure. But it just, I would love to be in his mind right now, just sitting there. What do you, what are you thinking? What's going through your head at the moment? Are you taking it as a disrespect? Is it a funny thing? Um, are you just bewildered and you have no real opinion and you just just shocked at the matter? I wonder what's actually going through his head. Does it kind of bring up all these weird insecurities that you might have, right? It's just a complete shit. Game today. <laughs> he takes a drink, of course. <laughs> Let me pull it a bit. Look, he's still looking at him. And then, and then but to be fair to Dave, he does get a bit stoic in the middle. He just kind of accepts the situation and he's like, you know what? Larry King's being a bit of a dick. It is what it is. I'm just going to roll with it and keep keep on moving it. That's a 333 batting average cannon. He's legitimately well, talking David to his Ruben's grandson, I think it is. Podcast about now. I'm on his show or something, right? While talking to you, the audience is watching me talk to you. And when am I gonna see it? I'm, uh, tonight. But again, I just I just wish I can't I just I just pray and hope that this is a life a, a kind of a goal that I'll be able to achieve later on in my life, you know? The ability to be this old and just not give a shit. That's the thing that you start to realize, especially the older you get. When you're younger, you're like, oh, man, I just want to be young forever, man. I'm 18. I'm a teenager. Right? You love being young. right? You just. Fr- I remember when I was young, I used to throw at people's faces all the time. I'm 20. I'm, I'm 19. Right? And like, oh, my God. Wow. You're so smart. You're 19. Right? You used to get so big. You're like, yeah, man, I'm smart. Man, I'm 19. Then you, <laughs> then, then you meet someone actually smart who's 19. And you're like, oh, shit. I'm dumb as fuck. Right? And then you realize you're 19 and you're still at home, right? You can't go out anywhere. You're, you're legitimately like a an an adult baby, right? Legitimate adult baby. You might have a little bit of a goatee, but your mum still rings your phone and tells you where the fuck are you? Come back home. It's 11 p.m. And then you get to this age and you're like, oh, you know what? Actually, being older is amazing, right? You just get to just leave other things behind. Just get to move on with your life and go in, other, in another direction. And you, and and then especially interaction wise, you just get to do. Other f- you just get to do things like this. Answer the phone in the middle of a conversation, fall asleep during a you know a family function or when you're at your friend's party and no one cares, right? Nowadays, if I fall asleep at a house party, you know, I might end up on Instagram somewhere, right? I might end up on Instagram covered in toilet paper or with makeup all over my face. But once you hit the age of 50, 60, it's not, you know, no one cares anymore about sharing a picture of you sleeping on the city. You know, it's, it's normal. How many times have you seen pictures of Kanye sleeping? in function somewhere with Kim, right? It, it doesn't get, it's not funny anymore now, isn't it? We know he's an old man. He gets tired, you know? He's got four kids. He should be asleep. If he's running around doing lines and, you know, jumping out of airplanes with a parachute, you'd be questioning him a bit, wouldn't you? <laughs> but yeah, it's a funny exchange. I thought that'd be a good way to open the show up. Um, But yeah, definitely check it out. It's a video called um Larry King Gets a Call. I'll put it in the show notes description so you can check it out yourself. But yeah, um, Larry King's a legend. Absolute legend. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the... Um, outcome was this out what the what the outcome or what happened after the fact but yeah for our view in public that was amazing to see Ruben have to go through that awkward situation because it happened before and it? it happened I remember it might have happened to me previously too where I've been in the interview and someone's generally taking a phone call like they've legitimately taken it and you know when you go to interviews right you're already you're, you're already quite nervous right I wouldn't say that I wouldn't necessarily say I'm a, the most nervous person in the world or the most you know frightened in those kind of social situations but even for myself 
you know, you're already, you're kind of nervous what to say. You don't want to fuck up. You don't want to make a mistake. You want to make sure you remember your experiences and all your points and blah, blah, your achievements. And then, you know, naturally it starts off a bit weird anyway, because you get to the place that you're going to interview to and interview at, sorry. And you're like, you know, you're, you think you're late, but you're not late. So you got that kind of like, you know, weird pressure happening, right? Weird little spikes of adrenaline. You go from like, oh my God, I'm going to be late. And then suddenly you crash. No, I'm going to be early. I'm all right. And you get there, you're on time or you're early. And then, you know, suddenly you're having to wait 10 minutes for the person to get free or to come out of a meeting or to... Rem- Usually, when they say they're in a meeting and you have an interview, just know that most likely, and oft- more often than not, because I've been in a situation myself, I've been on the other side of the table. More often than not, what happens is that they just forget. Because interviews are the thing that no one wants to do. Don't don't be confused. Like, whenever they give you that face about, oh my God, hey, welcome. So good to see you. Oh, what's your name again? Oh, yeah, yeah, great, great. All that shit is just for show. They're not happy to see you, right? They want to get on with their work. They've got deadlines coming up. They've got to pick up their kids at school. The last thing they want to do is get to know a new person, right? Ask, ask, you, ask you these questions, feign interest. Oh, my God, you went to that place. Okay, great. Oh, you were before. Oh, you're a human. They don't really want to know all that shit. They don't care. So the fact that you're there in front of them wasting their time is enough as it is. So they usually forget. Then they get reminded by the receptionist or whoever's office manager at the time or the HR, whoever bumps into you at the beginning. Because usually that's what makes you even more nervous. You go into a place to an interview and then you get there and there isn't even an office manager or someone to greet at the front door. It's just like whoever was happened to be walking in or out of the office, whoever was uh, whoever was unlucky enough to kind of catch your eye and you smiled and they were like, oh, and they, and they felt kind of bad to leave you hanging. So they'll come over and say, oh, by the way, you got an interview, okay, cool. And they'll go get the person. So then you're already on tender hooks. Oh my God, that isn't even the person I need to speak to. That's just like a random person that works here. And do you know what I mean? Now you're super nervous. You made you, you you get made to wait 10 minutes, maybe as a little test to see how you react. And then you finally get to inside the place and you're having the conversation or, you know, you get you get over the little hump of the first 10 minutes of walking to the interview, right? Where are you from? What's your name? Oh, your name's really weird. Where's it come from? Blah, blah, blah. The area you live in. Oh yeah, I know the area. I, I, I'll pass down the train. All these in innate in these just stupid questions that just go nowhere. You suddenly suddenly get into a bit of a flow. You start feeling yourself. You're like, yeah, cool. I, I know I'm talking about. I know I'm gonna say. And then suddenly the person across the table answered the phone, and you're like, what? Number one, you didn't even know phones were allowed to ring in this hallowed place, right? This little four quadrant little zone you have where you have to speak about yourself and you know uh, give the impression that you know what you're doing when you clearly don't. And then suddenly this person breaks the fourth wall and answers the phone call. You're like, oh my God. And even more nervous if they answer the phone call. You know, it's happened before, you know. It's a, you know, you, you never know. You might be interviewing with the, the CEO or the creative director. So, you know, they're busy people. They might have to answer a phone call or two. It's not a big deal. The one that's really going to cure is if they have to answer a phone call and they do their international, I'm busy, and they put the finger up. Yeah, sorry. And they walk outside. That's when you start shitting bricks. You start shitting absolute bricks. You're like, oh my God, I got here on time. I was made to wait for 10 minutes. I don't even know what I'm going to say next. Now they're going outside. Are they going to remember who I am? Uh-huh. I got paid rent. Uh-huh. And then you suddenly start getting into a bit of a spiral and it goes all in control. So I can only imagine that might be the similar sort of effect that Larry King had on Dave Rubin, right? Like you start, you're finally across the table from your idol, someone you look up to, an inspiration. And he goes on and does something like that. You're like, wow, okay. Like, fair enough. He's like, you know, the rumors are true. Larry King's a pain in the ass. <laughs> or he's just old, isn't it? <laughs> oh, my God. Anyway, um, let's get into some topics. Some topics that I've seen on the news that I thought were of interest. And then we can go from there. So, number one. Dominic Reyes versus John Jones. So, I'm sure some of you are aware this fight happened when. When did it happen? A while back ago? Should a while back? Yeah, a while back. I say a while back. Um... Last weekend, um, John Jones faced Dominic Reyes for another defense of his um, light heavyweight title. I think prior to the actual uh, fight itself, a few people kind of ripped the fight off, I think, for the most part, because, you know, John Jones has defeated every challenge that's come across him. He's he's looked maybe human against Ovent Saint Peru, OSP. Apart from that, he's dominated everyone else that he's basically faced, and there's been calls for him to kind of go up to heavyweight to kind of challenge himself, and so we can see the, the new, fresher John. And with Dominic Reyes as well, it's hard to read him as an actual MMA fighter. He's not got that much experience, even though he's won, I think, is it 13 fights? I think it's 13, or he's had 13 fights, or 12 fights, or whatever it may be. So, um, 
he's got a pretty decent record, but not you know not as extensive as someone like John Jones, of course. And for the most part, most of his kind of you know highlight reel wins have come from knockout, right? I think left high kick, left high kick, and left straight hook. I think so, right? So that's usually the kind of finish that you see from him. So nothing varied, not not a lot of wrestling, not a lot of ground and pounds. I think there might be a submission in one of them. I'm not too sure. One of these finishes, I forgot which one it was. Uh, might have been a rear naked choke or someone. I'm not sure who. But for the most part, you know, it's, he, he, he looked like the kind of guy that he, the only way he's going to win against someone like John is basically to knock him out. And if you know anything about John Jones, you know he's got a, his arsenal is just too much. You can't just go in there hoping to knock him out. Because what we also proved, especially in this fight and maybe even with Gustafson, you know, John Jones got a pretty good good chin. Like for somebody that for somebody that fights where he does, because it's not really a thing usually, right? I look, I think of somebody like um uh Michael Benham Page, right? He doesn't have the best of, of chin. Um when he does get hit, he kinda goes down. But with John Jones, you kind of get the feeling that he puts a pressure on you. He has a huge arsenal of skills. He's obviously got that mean heel streak in him where he can kind of go um completely dark. And kind of, you know, spark you out and ground and pound you on the floor like he did to, like, um, uh, Daniel Cormier. But again, it was, you know, once a short of fire happened, what was going on? For myself, I tend, I, I decided to stay up that night um, incorrectly. I ended up having to go out the Sunday, the following Sunday in the afternoon, which was an absolute horror show. So I was an absolute zombie. But, you know, I like to watch these things live. I kind of feel as if, like, even though a lot, not a lot of people that I follow on social watch UFC, I always get a feeling I'm going to stumble across the, um, what do you call it? The, the winner of who the kind of you know the spoilers of who won and stuff so i prefer just watch it straight live so i'm watching the fight and obviously it, uh, oh, um just to kind of get to the end of the whole point of the issue um john Jones end up winning right by a split decision via the judges but the scoring was really weird again i wouldn't say it was a robbery i think a lot of people have kind of mentioned it prior um it obviously wasn't a robbery um i don't think anyone was going to go out and say yeah they categorically think um uh John Jones was the better man, or Dominic Reyes was either. But I think judging in MMA or UFC, I like I like the fact that for as much because I remember there was a, there was a point in time where a lot of UFC fans or MMA fans were a bit snobbish and a little bit arrogant when it came to um, corruption, right? In boxing, right? They were like, "Oh, it can never happen in our sport. Our sport is clean. Our sport is pure, right?" But obviously, as more popular the sport has become, you know. USADA's got involved, um, essentially they've essentially eradicated PEDs for the most part. There are people who can obviously get away with it if they've got the resources and the money to do it. But for the most part, it's very hard to cheat if you're an MMA and UFC, right? But there was an issue with PEDs and performance science and drugs previously, or steroids, whatever you're going to call them. Um, they've kind of got a grip on that. But for the most part, the idea, the, the most kind of corrupt part of boxing that people kind of allege is corrupt is the ref, is the judging, sorry. Maybe the refereeing maybe comes second, but for the most part, it's the judging. The judging is the thing that really affects boxing for the most part because that's where most of the money, especially in Vegas, is made, right? On the betting odds. Um, a lot of people's career trajectory, a lot of people's brand sponsorships. There's a lot of kind of, you know, greasing of the palms, you know, slipping of the money in the front pocket, like in a mafia movie going on in boxing. And unfortunately, because the UFC has to deal with uh, commissions, state commissions, wherever they kind of fight, who all have their own individual procedures and they all have their own host of... No, it's weird. They have individual commissions in each state, but then usually it's the same judges that um, officiate most of the fights. It's like, a, I don't know, let's say there's like a, a database of 50 people. It feels as if they just kind of select a, f a random five and get them to go and um, officiate or to judge fights, which is odd because, you know, these judges for the most part, even if they are experts, which I, I highly doubt they are, if they are experts, they're experts in judging boxing fights, right? Which are completely different to MMA. MMA, you've got the addition of, you know, knees, legs, I don't know, your whole leg, your elbow, your, you know, you've got the wrestling component of it. Um, you've got the grappling component of it. It's just an incredibly weird thing to suggest that somehow a boxing judge could have somehow judge, you know, an MMA fight or a UFC fight. It just doesn't make any sense. So essentially, essentially, those judges, you know, fucked it up for Dominic Reyes and somehow someone, uh, I forgot who the guy was, I think it was the guy that Joe Rogan called out, stated that, I think when he judged it, he said he had John Jones up 3-2, which is insane because I think if you look at the fight, you'd say the first two rounds Dominic Reyes had, right? It's a five-round fight. Dominic Reyes had two, the first two rounds for sure, right? The third round, I'm not too sure about, right? But then the fourth and the fifth, you'd, probably, you'd definitely say Jones. But... To say that somehow Jones won it clearly 3-1, one, 
or like some other people have said, or four one or whatever it may be, is insane. It's literally insane because he lost the first two rounds. He might have drawn the third, but then by the time it comes to the last two, the fight's already done, right? For the most part, it's just an insane way to do it. And the problem and the sad thing about someone like Adamic Reyes is that even if he does get the rematches, it's probably unlikely. We know how John Jones performs in rematches, right? He usually, you know, absolutely dominates the opponent because he's kind of, you know, he's kind of downloaded his de- your database of, en- of information and he's going to now be able to kind of enact what he needs to do in the next second round, second fight. But also, on Don Ray's side, to be kind of sad for him is that if you're John Jones' team, you're not going to encourage him to go and take this. You're not going to encourage John Jones to fight Don Ray's again because you don't know how good Don Ray's might get between now and the next fight either, right? Because... If we've seen, if if any if anything we've noticed in UFC, as much as people kind of grow exponentially or kind of their skill set goes like the structure of their skill set goes, especially if they concentrate. Like I look at someone like Valentina Zhitchenko, she's always been very talented, but her level that she's at now is just like on another. She's just on another level. Uh, even though Jorge Masvidal, Masvidal, the same sort of thing, right? He you know had the had kind of an, an epiphany and he completely changed the way he approached fights, and now he looks a completely different person. As much as it can go that way, it can also go the other way down, right? I look at someone like a BJ Penn, right? Suddenly, you know, of course, BJ Penn might be other issues involved there, but how can you somehow go from being, you know, one of the best in your weight class and, a, you know, a living legend to suddenly go to somebody that can't win a fight in a flipping, you know, you can't even win a fight against a bouncer in the middle of, you know, Hawaii somewhere, right? So if you're John Jones' team, you're like, you know what? Let's let's hold off fighting this guy again, this hung, young, hungry lion who's a legitimate athlete who, you know, was unfortunate not to get selected for the uh, for the NFL. Now has kind of adopted his skills as a boxer. Has really good movement, you know. Has really good boxing skills. Like he legitimately looked. Because it's weird. Because whenever you see a UFC fighter fight, especially when they they're kind of more boxing orientated, they never usually have the right. They never usually have a very good. I bet maybe it's the way you kind of move in the ring anywhere. An octagon is different than you would do in the ring, but. Don't Reyes looked at maybe the the first maybe one I've seen so far who kind of had that a, a legit boxing style. Someone that he looked at, he could actually box for real. Not like, you know, MMA box, which is a completely different type of boxing. But yeah, man, like, I'm really kind of um bummed for uh, Dominic Reyes. I think, again, I think he, he... But the good thing for him is that he put a good showing on. I think a lot of people like myself who weren't that sure about him and kind of thought he was just a one-punch bang kind of guy and wasn't necessarily that skilled as an MMA fighter. We've kind of been proven completely wrong he is a legit talent at that weight class and he will give a lot of people problems for someone like john jones going forward the issue is that what's happening is this an indication that john jones's skills or his um his ability to finish people in a way that he did previously his creativity his brutality his athleticism is this an indication that he's on the wane or is it just the fact that he's not feeling motivated fighting the people that he's fighting because, you know, as bad as it may seem or sound, if you're John Jones, there must be a part of you that believes that you can absolutely beat anyone in that weight class because you've obviously proven it, right? No one can come close to you. You legitimately think you're the baddest man on the planet. So it's quite hard to work yourself up to get up to the point of like giving a shit about a fight when you know if you, even your 10% could knock most people out, right? And if you believe the rumors, he wasn't, you know, necessarily taking this training camp that serious either. He might have been out, you know, doing the old, uh, doing the old devil's dandruff, right? And dancing with the old uh, chicas in Las Vegas casinos. Um, so that might have been the issue. So there is probably something in the idea that maybe we need to see John Jones at heavyweight sooner rather than later because that's the only way we're going to see someone motivated and hungry. Because at the moment, he doesn't seem it or want to be on that position at all. He's probably like way away from that. So again, more questions than answers really on the John Jones side. For the Reyes side of it, again, I think he's a beast. I think he's going to give a lot of people problems. I think no one's going to really want to fight him because he's obviously shown that he can, you know, defend a takedown against John Jones. The same John Jones that ragdolled Daniel Cormier around who was an Olympic gold medalist, right? So <laughs> if that's the case, then I wouldn't want to fight Dominic Reyes even. I just think it's a very sad situation for all involved i think it would have been nice to get Re- even if Reyes had the belt for one for one fight i think it would have been nice just to have the idea that you know he he broke john jones record and if john jones would come and fight him again to get the record back i think that would have been, we would have seen probably an, a very very motivated john jones in that regard as well but you know it's not to be it is what it is um good showing for all involved and again um, a very interesting card like i said the valentino Juschenko fight was was astounding as well the the level of like uh, that's the reason why I like I really like watching MMA. 
I think combat sports in general is that sometimes, especially being from the UK or being from Europe, I, you tend to mostly watch the, you know football, what we call here soccer, and that's the only sport you we, you legitimately watch. And maybe with the exception of maybe tennis, I would say. So it's hard to get a gauge on. So when it comes to American sports, we don't really know what's the we don't really have a rough gauge or estimate about who's the best at anything because there's no reference point, right? I can't really tell you. For me, all running backs in the NFL look the same, right? Because they just run, right? All quarterbacks are the same because they just throw the ball. I can't necessarily tell the difference between the Mahomes and the flipping, you know, I don't know, whoever the other guy is, right? I can't tell any difference between them. But combat sports, because it's not, you know, especially MMA or the UFC, because it's quite a young sport, it's something I've kind of followed um, quite for a long time. I've seen it develop over time. Um, I've obviously taken a few, you know, group on Muay Thai kickboxing classes and stuff. So I know where I am stand at level wise. I know what I've seen in classes. And I also know what I've seen, you know, maybe 10 years ago in the UFC. So to see where it's got now and to see high level people, right, standing at octagon, man or woman, and try to figure out a way to take someone else, someone's head off who happens to be as equally as skilled as you is so entertaining man it's probably the best thing to watch honestly it really it really gives you a like you know sometimes you know what happens when you watch boxing you tend to um, maybe it's speaking from, from my own experience but when i when i watch boxing i tend to get a very um heightened or i tend to get the del- sense of delusion like i get delusions of grandeur like i said i tend to go out there thinking yeah i'm mike tyson you know i can knock someone out left hook right hook uppercut right jab 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 um, it tends to make you think a bit more of yourself than what you actually are. But I think with MMA or UFC, in my experience, when I watch it, it really humbles me. Cause it's like, wow, if you if ever there was a time to understand that you shouldn't mess with anyone, it's watching an MMA fight. Because some of these guys, especially some of the dudes in like the welterweight division, you would never, even some of the heavyweights, like you bump into that guy in the street, unless you have an idea of what an MMA fighter looks like, you would never know. You'd pick a fight with this person or you want to show in front of your friends or act a big man and you could potentially you know be out unconscious on the on the concrete right having no idea what happened to you so <laughs> i think that's the best part of watching it you get very very you get very humbled man you get very very humbled you're like oh, wow these guys know what the, these guys know what they're doing in the octagon but yeah um good showing for dominic reyes and again i think um i think we've got some we got some interesting questions and stuff to look forward to for John Jones' next fight, man. Because I don't think it's going to be a doozy. That's for sure. We know we know that he's not at his best at the moment. Maybe it's because of lack of a competition, but we also know that maybe Father Time is going to catch up with all of us, isn't it? As some a lot of um, MMA analysts always say, when Father Time comes, it doesn't really, you know, ask for your opinion. It just kind of comes along and says, "Hey, by the way, it's over now. You got to move on." But yeah, let's move on as well. From this one to the next topic, what do we have here? Oh, this is quite a cool interview. Um, a little feature here with um this DJ called Monster on Resident Advisor, which I wanted to quickly talk about. Obviously, I'm sure most of my listeners or viewers are familiar with the Resident Advisor mix series that they put out. Um, I'm not sure if it's a, even a they have a date with it, if it's a bi-weekly or week or monthly thing, but they're churning them out, you know, all the time. They're up to 715 now. It's insane. There is an there is this idea that I have what uh, which I've had for a while actually to kind of do my own sort of mix series like this, but to kind of continue it week on a weekly basis, maybe twice a week. I don't know what the a good ratio is to upload DJ mixes. Is it two week? Is it twice a week? Once a week? I guess it would be twice or maybe once, so you could keep. So there was an idea that you were buying or downloading fresh records in a week and then kind of showcasing them in the mix, right? And that's not including your um, rec- recordings of your DJ sets playing live, right? I would imagine, right? That would be a good way to do it. Like every week, you kind of buy them tracks and you play them out. Um, that's what most people would do, right? Especially if you're doing it on the side as a hobby. You work Manager Friday. Um, you might pick up some tunes here and there while you're on your computer at work. Get back, get home on a Saturday morning. Open, crack open a beer and play some tunes in your house. And I think that would be a good way to do it. But anyway, back to the interview. Um, RA715 um, featuring Monster. Again, not that familiar with this um, young lady at all. I think her DJ name is pretty cool, Monster. Um, it says here, the Oramix member leans into her dark side. And as p- I usually always skip the interviews, but lately I've been reading a lot of them, the RA ones with the mix series. I usually kind of get my interview 
uh, content from RA on the Resident Advisors Exchange side of things. I usually kind of miss out on the written interviews, but they're really thought-provoking and they're really interesting because you get to a kind of glimpse of what it must be like to be like you know, a professional, uh, high-flying, you know, jet-setting kind of DJ and also kind of get an idea behind what goes into some people's mixes. Some of the time it's just, you know, it's just the DJ saying, hey, I wanted to show you guys what I'm usually playing or out when I'm in a club in case you don't hear me in your local town. Or it's sometimes a chance for them to kind of, you know, um, talk about uh, stuff that's concerning outside of music, maybe to espouse some sort of political opinion or if your mama's shake, you know, accuse the industry of being misogynistic, even though, you know, you're getting booked by the same people. Anyway, let's continue. But this monster had a really good point when it comes to... Um, what would I see here? There's a very cool, interesting interview bit that she said here that I thought was very interesting. That I think is regarding the conservative attitudes that exist in Poland, her native country, I'm assuming, right? Da, 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 da. Um, so here's here's a question bit, yeah, on this. So it says this from R8. So it's the following. Let me zoom in here a little bit and get this up on the screen. Is it up on there? Yes, it is. Okay, so it says here, Poland's current administration has been characterized by anti-gay propaganda. With things coming to more visible head following by your Biliastok pride. How is the queer music scene in Poland responding to the country's political environment? And Monster replies, What you need to understand about Poland is that there's currently a huge divide between the largest Polish cities and the smaller towns, usually in a worse economic situation with less access to good education. And while there are pride marches attended by thousands of people in Warsaw, Poznan, where I live, and Krakow, and Groklo, and Gdansk, there are a lot of uh, places where the conversation about LGBTQIA plus rights has just started. Those are the towns where we've been seeing trouble, uh, troubling reactions to the pride marches. Some of them have declared themselves LGBTQ plus free zones, which is insane. And the government propaganda is only making it worse. What I liked about this answer, I think, from my end, is that I think if you're like a... Um, Imagine you're like a dance music aficionado, you know, electricity music fan, you're a, you're, you're, a, you're a contributor to the scene, you go and attend festivals, you then go and create your own label, become a DJ, put, you know, uh, create a little collective, do your own thing, you're in part of it, right? There is this understanding or maybe an assumption that you've probably gone around the world, right? You've probably traveled around Europe, gone to other places, and it's kind of informed where you see the scene, right? So... It would be really easy for someone like her, in Monster's case, to kind of be a little bit uh, bitter, to be a little bit angry, upset, frustrated, and just kind of, you know, act out when it comes to the LGBTQ plus scene in Poland, as opposed to where it might have been any other place that she might have traveled to, whether it's Berlin, Amsterdam, London, Paris, Madrid, Barcelona, right? She goes to all these other places and it's, prob and it's fine, right? She's like in heaven. It's like this um, utopia that she's living in, or that she's that she's kind of temporarily visiting. And then you go back to your hometown, and you're like, bloody hell, my home country, and it's like super backwards. But to have this kind of compassion in this sentence, which I really thought was understanding, and quite telling. This idea that the largest cities in Poland are pretty cool, but it's the smaller ones with worse economic situation and have less access to education. So, as much as it could be just the idea that you know that part of the region that part of the country or that part of the world is just you know they're going to be conservative until the day they die it is what it is i think there are some places in the world that are like that i don't think any amount of uh social awareness will change it there's some of the things it's just one of those things right it's, it's like that kind of what was that tribe in an island that you know doesn't welcome any foreigners anymore after that one guy went and fucked up for everyone right they just kill anyone on site there's that kind of there's those places that you're not going to educate them out of their stance right they might have just they might just have to be phased out over time um you know in terms of uh, the other generations might come up and they might become more and more understanding more quote-unquote westernized but for the most part you're not going to change those people on that remote island right their point of view has kind of been long ingrained as part of their dna part of their identity same with probably this you know how they view um same-sex marriage in these kind of uh far-flung places in eastern or eastern central europe however you refer to poland but I do like this. I do. Uh, I do kind of have sympathy and really uh, kind of sympathize with this idea that you know, in a smaller town where there's not much access to education or you're suffering economically, to have all these quote unquote queers come into your city or your little town for an amazing party in a great little venue, having the time of their life, carefree. I guess it would kind of leave you a bit embittered. And if you're someone like Monster, you could probably you could probably have sympathy with the reason why they're so angry. Isn't that? they're angry with you or your way of life or who you choose to sleep with 
they're just angry at the fact that you are living so free and they are still constrained or restricted by the limits I've been placing on that I have nothing to do with them, right? When a government fails its people, um, usually the most downtrodden are the ones affected, isn't it? And they have no right, they have no say in what happens next. They have no right even, they have no right in kind of fighting their position in the first place, right? They're just there, you know, left to the woods, left to the wolf, sorry, and kind of left to kind of fend for themselves, really, for the most part. So I really like the fact that she kind of had this level of compassion, really, in terms of the situation. And didn't see it as like a no we have to go into these small towns in poland and show them that it's all good and they're wrong and they're bigger it's like no no no. we understand that it's a far bigger issue outside of our need to kind of rave in dark places right um but also using that kind of need to rave in dark places you know which is quite surface and whatever using it as a kind of trojan horse to kind of you know talk about some really really important topics um again it continues here uh We've been hearing groundbreaking stories about the spike in quiz, youth suicide rates, which is horrible to hear, which is a non issue, which is non issue for the current government. And while the queer scene is organizing against the, the government's outrageous policies, we're still mostly based in bigger cities. Oramic's Total Solidarity VA compilation has raised thousands of euros, which are supposed to help the queer communities in small towns. As Oramics, we've uh, been trying to get funds to organize workshops in those places, and one of our main goals is education. And if we could strengthen the queer scene in small towns in any way, that would really help. That is amazing, right? That is amazing to hear. This idea they're not going in there with like a sledgehammer and trying to tear down all these old institutions. Instead, they're trying to educate, right? They're trying to just bring awareness to the fact that, look, we do exist. We are your fellow countrymen, countrywomen, right? Um, we should be living harmoniously amongst each other. And the only way to do it is for somebody to kind of have the sense of humility to kind of bring themselves down to quote unquote their level in order to enact some kind of change. I just don't know, man. Like, the rest of the interview is really cool. I recommend you check it out. But I thought it was really interesting to see, like, the difference between her politically motivated uh, interview and mixed series and just the fact that, you know, she stands for more than just, you know, getting high and going out. And also the difference between this interview and what Mama Sheikh had to say, which is Mama Sheikh or Mama Snake, whatever her name is, who was, in my opinion, probably the reason why they ended up closing the comments on RA, right? One of the best bits about RA was the comments, right? You get, you, you got to see exactly what not to, what was the right decision and what the, was the wrong opinion when you read the comments, right? Because most of the writing on RA is brilliant anyway, but you saw the difference in approach, right? One side, I don't know, that Mama Shake woman was just like, you know, I don't know what was, what her, what her, what, what, what B was in her bonnet. And then you get to see this woman who kind of, you know, lives a talk, walks a walk, walks a walk, lives a walk, walks a walk, talks a talk or talk walk, walk whatever that term is and um yeah he's doing it in a really good way and um, i don't know man just a, it's a super inspiring story i think it's really really cool because again it's probably a thankless task it's probably something that hasn't really won her any friends or you know com um sympathy even within some of the more conservative places in poland but again someone that hasn't you know she's not run away from her, her home country she's not gonna you know set up studio somewhere you know a satellite studio in berlin somewhere and just kind of ranted and raving on the internet she's actually there on the ground um really trying to prevent um youth suicide rate spiking again which is a horrible side effect of those kind of things in it but yeah do recommend you check it out really cool mix um and a great interview from monster on ra now do, do, do. next on the list what else do we have here let's move on Oh, talking about electronic music or dance music in general, there's this really cool article from The Guardian, I think it is, right? Which I read. Oh, what's happening here? Flourishments. Are flourishing or flourishments? What's that here? Hmm. Let's see here. Oh, God. Yeah, no, still uh, flourishing. Okay, cool. There we go. I'll take these comments off. So, this article from The Guardian was released, I think, a, well, a couple of, a few days ago. It's been shared a few times, and it's really interesting because it kind of speaks upon something that i think a lot of people are familiar with if you've been out in the east london scene especially around you know the whole hackney Rick warehouse area or some of the stuff that's been happening with the part part in the parks and stuff and what are they called what's that bloody team called again uh keep on going or keep on going or keep it going wherever the, those people are that do those porous rays that used to happen in the summer last year so if you're familiar with that scene you would know that this is, should be no surprise but this is a really uh, cool way to kind of encapsulate it with the story from the guardian uh it's a club culture it's called um the it's i will get again i'll link it in the comments for you listening via the podcast app or if you're watching you want to read it later 
um it's called austerity gentrification and big tunes why legal raves are flourishing this is from the guardian um i'll just quickly get up here on the screen and we can read it through and then talk about some of the topics that are at hand so it says here um amid disillusionment with mainstream clubbing legal events are harking back to the original spirit of rave but police maintain that they are dangerous and criminals ever of course the police would say that though wouldn't they right the police the same people that are kind of trying to limit any kind of fun right that they take they take joy out of ruining the fun that's the thing i have hate about the police in the uk they really enjoy locking down parties and kind of ending things um but anyway let's continue um so it's an hour after midnight um on new year's day 2020 and a stream of revelers are gathering in an alleyway next to kfc on london's old kent road they pass between piles of car tires and par and through a gap in a gate where a group wrapped in hats and scarves are taking five pound notes from each person who enters the yard on a recently abandoned car carpet right warehouse inside the lights are on the groups of party goers are huddled in groups talking waiting and smoking at a behemoth sound system and makeshift bar constructed against one wall next door in a larger abandoned warehouse that was formerly an office outlet an even bigger sound system is being built there's a sense of anticipation as the warehouse fills up with a mohawked punks tracksuit squatters crusties and rude boys accountants graphic designers students and gray-haired veteran techno heads everyone has come together looking for the same thing a night of loud music and dancing without the constraints of the regulated club culture no closing time no dress code no age limit no searches on the door which is essentially the problem in it that we have i think um i've said it ad nauseum on here before but i guess the issue is never really the fact that these things are not happening it's just that the more interesting things are happening way outside the fringes right they're happening um under the noses of some of the people who probably should need to go right people that should probably have that kind of experience who are coming to london and sense of going to like an authentic clubbing experience i haven't been subjected to you know dreadful nights out in liverpool street soho shoreditch dawson now because it's kind of got gone a bit tits up and those places were good before but you know they were good because they were an alternative to what was going on on the fringes now that they've kind of turned into these kind of you know uh clubbing or bar versions of pret a manger or pret a manger have you fucking pronounced that place right <laughs> um then they're no longer worth going anymore and now what's happened is that those same people still exist that's the issue that I've, that I've never understood like you can close as many clubs as you want down in london you can deny people to go out in certain places you can you know have you know 17 fucking werewolves standing outside of fabric right and and you know security guards that shove their hand up your asshole right you can do all that stuff but those people that are going to be that are going to be put off by going there they still exist they don't suddenly die so where do you think they're going to go they're not going to suddenly turn into monks and refuse to go outside anymore. They're just going to put on events for themselves that they're going to enjoy. But then the problem with those events is that the, the events are going to be in unregulated spaces. There's not going to be any health and safety measures put into place. There's going to be um, all sorts of people being let in because there will, there'll be no turning away on the door. There's no door picking, right? If you if you put, if you go and hire a warehouse somewhere in the middle of Old Kent Road and all you and your friends chip in 500 quid each, that's a lot of money you want to uh, you want to make your money back so it's not likely that you're going to then turn people away at the door you're going to receive any five pound you get it doesn't matter where the five pound comes from or who's it comes from if it comes from a very shifty looking dealer who you have no idea who he is and he ends up coming in and selling people pills that are laced with fentanyl then look what happens look who, look what happens what's the issue there you have revelers dying in your warehouse party that you set up with you and your friends but then look at the reason this has happened go back in time it's the local councils it's the lack of movement or lack of kind of foresight or kind of uh, i don't know vision when it comes to the knights are this is stuff that's going on in the london mayor loads of in loads of kind of missing links have kind of led to the situation that we're in now where essentially people are willing in london especially are willing to risk their safety their health right to go and rave somewhere in a dingy warehouse somewhere i'm like you know whatever doing whatever just because they can't put up with going out on another night in Liverpool Street Station or Shoreditch or whatever it may be. They just can't put up with it. They'd rather risk their life trying to have some sort of, you know, authentic fun than go to these kind of other places. 
And again, I have sympathy with it. I totally do. But let's continue with the article here. Um, in recent years, unlicensed underground raves like these, which are run by decentralized networks and South Sound Systems and party crews, have flourished across the UK. As legitimate club nights have founded uh, in the face of Tigger, sorry, t- Tigger, tighter licensing requirements and population of young people with less disposable income. In September, the drum and bass producer Goldie, who was awarded the MBE for his services in music 2016, singled out, singled out illegal uh, parties such as these key uh, pillars of the UK dance music scene amid struggle of clubs and increasing corporate festivals. Uh, Goldie says, I played an illegal rave in, forest, in a forest last night in Blackburn. Those kids are brilliant. Their love for music is pure. Raving cult, ra- culture ain't in, in, culture anything you put in a weekend festival, he said. Rave culture is thriving, but an underground level. People want to go to fucking raves. People want to go to legal parties. Which is true. Again, I would I would argue that people don't actually want to go to them. I would argue that they've got no other option. I think that's what I would say with that one. Um, Brian G, another Hall of Fame drum and bass DJ, started playing reggae at South London squat parties in the early 80s when he was 16. Today he's in his 50s and still plays along occasionally at unlicensed raves despite regularly DJing for crowds of over 7,000 people at legitimate commercial venues. He says, I've turned up to the unlicensed parties over the last couple of years and been shocked by the numbers, he says. Some club nights spend a ton of money on advertising and can't pull in anything like the numbers that they're getting at events. Which is true, but that's not really, that's a kind of false correlation, isn't it? Because even though, you know, you might not get the numbers that you want at a fucking X or Y, but at least you've got the, you know, at least you're in, at least you're kind of safe in the knowledge that you can go take a shit, right? You can wash your hands, you can have a piss. You can go out to a smoking area, right? I don't think there's much of a smoking area in a dingy warehouse somewhere in the middle of Forest Gate. But then on the flip side, you do have the um, possibility of actually discovering new interesting DJs, meeting interesting people, uh, having a memorable experience that you're going to remember. You know, as much as I love XOY, it's not the most, you know, it's not like a bucket list uh, requirement or goal to go to, right? Whilst you're in London. But imagine you stumble across a warehouse party somewhere, right? In the middle of fucking Manor House. And you're like, oh my God, this is sick. And you see, you know, the whole um, range of freaky people that come out on a night out in London. That's going to be something that's going to be way, way up more up your alley than anything else. So I definitely see the the pull of it. And again, having been to many myself, I know exactly where they're coming from. I just, I just wish we weren't in this position. I just wish we had the ability to have more places or clubs or spaces where people could go and get weird on the weekend right that was you know they had warm warm running water air conditioning heating good lighting decent security guards like i wish we had those things in place so that we weren't pushed to these kind of avenues because as much as as much as it's creative and it's amazing there's also the idea that all it takes is one death or this is one injury for the government to kind of really force the hammer down and completely lock them all up because there is part of me that's sort of like a lot of the cops probably let it go or the councils let it go because you know maybe it does kind of help their bottom line their uh, you know kids come in for the warehouse party they spend money at the flipping mcdonald's or the fucking kebab just around the corner or the off license kind of win-win police officers don't really want to go around running after a bunch of young people who are high off drugs right that's you know there's if there's one person you don't want to chase down the street somewhere it's a meth head right <laughs> or somebody has been in a couple of tea has been a, a couple of e-tablets like that's the worst type of person they've got the best endurance ever so maybe there is a bit of like you know what we're just going to turn a blind eye allow them to have their party and then lock it off at a reasonable time quote unquote right but again i'm very wary that it just takes one unfortunate event for the hammer to come down on everyone and then what anyway um it continues since the 80s the illegal rave scene has always been active on some level says john not his real name a member of the prolific london based free party crew there's no coincidence that the original boom in acid house free parties took place at the decade of tory government headed by margaret thatcher it's still here now and the current political climate is one reason why it's healthier than it's been in a long time but it's funny you mentioned margaret thatcher have you heard the story that supposedly um that era um was the the reason why we kind of you know our situation now we are we are now with illegal raves was that supposedly during the fracture era some mp or some you know um highfalutin um abdi abdi blue blood type person um complained to margaret thatcher's government 
because their property or you know they had like this big farm somewhere in the middle of the country that was uh taken over by ravers um and they complained uh went ballistic over the fact and then that one incident is basically what essentially kind of kabushed the whole rave scene in the uk for the most part because it wasn't obviously it wasn't only limited to london it was kind of taking you know to, got taking place all across the uk for the most part i think it even started outside the uk if i'm pretty sure and it kind of made its way down to the south so that one event at you know unlucky for the fucking ravers right the illegal raver promoters who put the event on the one place they go put the you know their rave on that person has to be happens to have a direct line of communication to Margaret Thatcher, complains to mummy and then she locks every single uh, rave down completely and now in a situation we're in now where you know in some london in most london venues actually in london this is not even i don't know nothing to do with this but it is probably it is attached to it but in most london venues of weatherspoons you don't get a dj in other Weatherspoons outside of London, you do get a DJ. Makes no sense. Anyway, um, let's continue here. The last couple of years have been have seen scores of unlicensed events um, across the country, from five thousand strong mega raves in Bristol warehouses to three day breakout sound clashes on the south coast beaches, to intimate sidetrust parties in the woodlands of Lancashire, and multi rig technivals. I love that on Scottish wind farms. Like John, many of these involved in the free party scene it believe that there are these events are becoming more important than ever amid the widening social divides and going the Tory austerity and the creeping gentrification. 100% agree with that. The free party veteran and the uh, acid techno innovator Chris Liberator says that unlicensed raves are a way for people to take back control of their local areas and even if it's only for one night. 100% because the risk reward system isn't great especially for the people putting it on. There's obviously the the kind of glory right project x glory way i think in project x is a good example he's reluctant to have anyone around his house and it kind of gets out of control but it's a memorable party and this one dorky dude ends up being like you know he knows he's he's kind of etched his name into history regardless of what happens regardless of his parents disown him he goes to prison he's he's kind of you know he's immortalized himself in the memory of all his people so there may be a part of that in a lot of these promoters for these warehouse parties where they're like, you know what, even if this gets locked off in an hour, the fact that I did it is enough anyway, right? It's kind of, you've already won because you've did this thing, right? You've kind of gone around, you've been on Google Maps the whole day, looking at places, trying to find units. You found one, the electricity is still running on it, or you've got in touch with the land, with the kind of the key holder. You slipped him a couple hundred quid and you've let the rave run. That's, that's epic. Um, so it says here, um, we're, we're culturally in a place where normal people can't control the environment at all, he says. I've seen the best pubs in my area turn into Starbucks, which is awful. Humongous, big... Co- and again, this is the issue that we're having, isn't it? Like, imagine being in a local pub, right, somewhere in your area. Shit, not shit area, but it's, let's say it's Homerton, right? What's the point of turning my local pub in Homerton where some of my local friends who happen to be producers, happen to be artists or DJs can play every weekend? Why turn that into like a... A, pu- a pub bar chain right into a brew dog or into like a pret or a starbucks what is the point of that there's no need just keep it independent keep it small allow that bar manager to have a license that takes them over maybe you know 4 a.m a couple of times a month so that they can then go so they did it to and then because it's a local bar there's no pressure for them to kind of book you know Seth trucks to come play in the local bar in homerton he can afford to go and let daisy and her friends to come and DJ on a night out because, and then if, if even if no one knows her, no one comes because it's, it's a local neighborhood bar. But then through effort, through promotion, through marketing, and through you know uh, just regularly playing, those girls cultivate an audience. They cultivate a little scene, a little community, and then boom, guess what? We have another hub. And I've always argued that in a weird way, even though they think gentrification adds to the area, like you know, in a gentr- in a gentrifier's mind, when Hacking Week blows up, if I'm thinking just like, again, because you just kind of think, if you're thinking just like a straight capitalist, right? You're thinking like, if Hacking Week is blowing up because warehouse warehouse right, raised, right? You somehow think in your head that your pre and customers have an overlap with people that go to warehouse raised. There's not really much of an overlap apart from, you know, if they're hungry, they might buy a sandwich. But for the most part, you know, they're going to be very health conscious. They might not have a lot of money anyway. They might have a lot of, they, they might have some preconceived ideas or notions or they might have a very strong position against buying in places like that anyway. So there's not much co- correlation apart from, you know, if they're hungry, they're humans, they might be hungry. But I guess if you're a capitalist in that way, you're like, you know what, let me put a pret manger there because then the same traffic that's going to these clubs will come to my pret manger But it doesn't work like that, right? Like, if anything, 
um, you're going to get more people coming to your shitty club or restaurant, wherever it is, if you allow that little independent spot, little independent pub, bar, nightclub in Homerton to operate, which is then going to allow those people to have a place to go to, a safe haven. So if they decide that they want to come to your shiny, you know, scent filled, uh, shitty music playing pub somewhere in the middle of Soho, they can come. They can, but they have, they they make constitution to come. The fact that they're turning all the clubs, all the bars, all the things into these kind of sterile environments that don't inspire anyone, right? It's just it defeats the purpose. It doesn't make any sense. And it and and then the people that would go to these kind of naff places, right? The kind of quote unquote normies. Like, they don't want to see each other in a bar. They want to kind of go there and feel cool. They want to see the weirdos and the freaks. But they're nowhere to be found because they wouldn't be called dead in there. So it's, a, it's just a strange, strange situation to be in. Like, very, very strange looking at it from the outside. Like, I, I wonder what the end goal is with these things. But anyway, um, there's no space for people to live. It says here continues, uh, let alone to throw events and have some fun with their uh, on their own terms. There's very little cultural representation for anyone apart from the mainstream. And even the mainstream clubs are struggling to stay open. Police, though, maintain that these events are a significant risk to the public order and public safety, in the words of Metropolitan Police Service Commander Dave Musker, boo, who is the national leader of unlicensed music events. Imagine that being, imagine that being your role, though, the lead for the unlicensed music events. Imagine how hard that would job that is. <laughs> Fuck me. He describes them as illegal. It's as illegal, dangerous gatherings that encourage antisocial behavior and are linked to a serious criminal activity. Yeah, the serious criminal activity that's always a misnomer. Like every warehouse rave I've been to, the most trouble there's been at a warehouse rave is people arguing about who's got change for five so they can buy balloons, right? Like, let's relax. No one's really fighting or getting to that much hassle, really, for the most part. They're quite self regulated. You know what's, ha- what's really interesting though? Warehouse parties. They're probably the most well-behaved places because for the most part, people are just chuffed to be there, right? You don't really get these kind of genuine um, rave experiences anymore, especially if you weren't from that era. You just might, you might read about it in books and stuff, but to kind of actually experience a proper, like, no, I'm not talking about the ones where it's like, you know, it's in like a studio somewhere where they, you know, where they shoot ID magazine. I'm talking about a proper warehouse where it's like, you know, this place was covered in, it's still covered in piss, but someone just decided to throw a party here like a genuine place that wasn't ever made to have humans in it let alone people dancing right um to to finally be in a place like that so right now people that are like-minded you feel chuffed and you don't want to fuck it up so people are quite well behaved though, to be honest i have to, I have to admit people are very, very well behaved um and as that organizers are changing the structure of their parties to counter police tactics understandably he refuses to detail those tactics on the site <laughs> by 3 a.m hundreds of people have filled the dimly warehouse the giant system is spreading out gut sa- gut shutting set of base heavy jungle and walls are covered in increasingly dense patchwork of graffiti tags that's interesting too i found most warehouse parties are quite dub reggae uh drum and bass jungle kind of infused i guess it's probably because of the origins but it's interesting to me that you don't really get many like warehouse parties that are like techno house based. There are a few, don't get me wrong, promotions out there, but most of it is dub, reggae, jungle. For the most, if, and if it's up to me, to be fair, I would prefer to go to some place like that and listen to that kind of music. If I want to hear techno, if I want to hear house, I know where to go to. But if I want to get a bit weird, right, listen to some trance, some acid, you'd know where to go to. Um, it continues here. Um... The, the, the graffiti tags. A heavy mass of ravers are thrashing and embracing on the thickly carpeted dance floor in front of the speaker stack. Around them uh, are signs that say 20% off 1,000 of, of carpets. In an area of austerity, the unlicensed rave scene offers people a low price alternative to illegal clubs, but that's not the main license, that's not the main reason people attend. According to Sophie Dunium, one half of the underground electronic music uh, duo My Bad Sister, which started out in seeing at Leroy Raves, it offers people a chance to it offers people a chance where they can come together as a community without prejudice and without intimidation, she says. Uh, people are risking arrest just to create a space where people can come together, no matter who they are. In a country where social divides are increasing, what the Tory government and other governments want to do is isolate people so that they can control them. When communities are united, they're stronger and they can't be pushed around, which is definitely true. But it's interesting to see, to think that a, a space, uh, warehouse spaces are kind of being built as safe spaces for people to go and club and have a good time, in, especially in the UK. But then in most clubs in the UK, especially if you're from the 
LGBTQ plus side of things, you'd say that most clubs in the UK aren't the most safe spaces for you, right? You're kind of pushing for more codes of conduct, more on-site help and stuff to kind of, you know, curtail maybe, you know, handsy patrons and shit. It's interesting, isn't it? That you would you would think to be never around. You'd think the warehouse rows would be the where, you know, people would be loosey goosey and doing whatever. But actually there's more accountability in warehouse parties because for the most part everyone's everyone's there for the right reasons, right? Love of music, love of the scene, wanting to connect, wanting to, you know, take part and just be around just be around, isn't it? That's it. It's just sometimes people don't even care about music. They just want to be where the energy's at. Um but then maybe clubs, you know, there's kind of conflict and interest that play when people are going there. Anyway, continues here. Uh, Duniam says um, that the ability of clubs and festivals to provide a smaller space, a similar space sorry, for free expression has been curtailed in recent years due to the stringent attitudes towards license agreements. So I definitely agree. Drug related uh, incidents have led to the closure of several clubs in recent years, including the Arches, who choose to relocate in Glasgow. Imagine all these clubs. In, imagine, fair enough, London is bad enough, but Glasgow and Edinburgh, like, um, the, I imagine there's not many that come there anyway. What is the point? Like, there's a lot of tourism there. You're obviously some people are obviously going to come for the to, for the you know clubbing tourism. Why not just keep it open as another stream of revenue income? It makes absolutely no sense. Anyway, um, the Arches, which used to be located in Glasgow and had its nightclub uh, license revoked 2015 after the death of Andre Clubber. In 2016, the London Super Club Fabric also saw license taken away for five months following the death of two 18-year-olds after taking drugs from the premises. It reopened in 2017 with stricter security regulations. It's like 1920 prohibition in America, Daniel says a legal club in scene. When we perform at Fabric, all the punters are searched and have their passports photocopied before they're allowed onto the club. And you can get chucked out for having a vape. That is insane, man. It, imagine what kind of state that puts you in. Going to an electronic music event, right? A dance music event, late at night, right? And you're being, you're being searched with sniffer dogs around you. You're being groped and pushed around by some big buddy security because the security are fabric they don't fuck around man and then your passport is getting scanned in like <sighs> many believe that the rave scene is filling a void left after a decline in grassroots venues defined by the mayor of london's office as those that focus mainly on music and playing an important role in local communities and hub of musicians in july figures revealed that there were only 100 grassroots music venues in the capital fair percent fewer than 2007 mama mia representative of a nationwide decline, the government select committee report published in 2019 warned that the closure of music venues represents a significant and urgent challenge to the UK's music industry and cultural vibrancy. There's a original picture here from Ashworth in 1989. Amazing. Love the ball cut. Interesting that the fashion here is still quite on point, isn't it? <laughs> um, the Bristol based DJ and producer of the record label, uh, Madid, Madid Terex, Madid, Madid Terex, who started her career DJing at free parties in the 80,000s in Buckinghamshire, says the innovative. The innovation that happens in the underground is what fuels the commercial scene. She also believes that the UK squat party scene offers a unique space for people to come together. She says, as a transgender woman, I've been to two different people. I've been two different people in the rave scene and I've been uh, openly welcomed throughout the whole thing. You get every single walk of life there. It's 10 a.m. on Oak Hill Road, New Year's Day. A flood of new people entered the former office outlet warehouse, which takes place in the office block in the South Bank. As the pale morning light streams through the skylight, hundreds of ravers are dancing to the hard track dreams of DJ and their falls bounce bride. A man with a wild head of grey hair is cutting intricate lines throughout the, prefer the, the peripheries of a crowd of a pair of roller skates swooping inches away from their teenagers asleep on the dance floor wrapped in a large yellow store closing sign. Since the original boom in the estate parties, in the late 80s, the unlicensed rave scene has been the target of media stories, scare stories, of course, uh, after drug overdoses and violence. But many of these uh, regular tenants said that they feel safer than they would do legal ten legal clubs, which I mentioned previously. Someone says here, parties take place without a problem every weekend, says Donium, comparing them with licensed events where people are kicked out at four in the morning or earlier if they have done something to piss off security. If you see a teenage girl and you haven't got money for a cab and the train starts not running until six or seven in the morning, being thrown out to leave you in a very vulnerable position. This would never happen in legal raids, where no one is getting paid to look after anyone. Everyone is out looking after each other as a community. Awesome. Wow, 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 wow. A beach rave in South Coast in 2000 August. This will be the last bit here. The, the, this is the gross reputation according to I've been attending legal race for more than 20 years says Madid Terex attending hundreds of illegal parties and I've never seen any violence any I have seen 
has actually come from the presence of police. If you go down any high street on a Saturday night, you see bars, brawls, and fights on the street. If you go to a rave, no one's fighting. Everyone is there to have a good time. Occasionally, you get a few bad people, but nine times out of ten, they are marched out of the rave as soon as they start something wrong. The raving carpet right at least passes off up about incident by 9 p.m. The, the last of the equipment is picked up into vans while a handful of remaining party goes sit around a small fire in the yard of the warehouse. Some are discussing the Tory campaign pledge to change the law of trespass and give police new powers to arrest people. Wow. So it went all the way until the next day, 9 p.m. No problems. They picked up the equipment and went away. Honestly, a really illuminated um, article. I think if you're part of the dance music scene, especially in the UK, and you feel a bit frustrated with things i think it's quite a cool um and encouraging article it kind of speaks about the things that we've kind of all gone through and kind of offers some solutions kind of you know reading between the lines but again for the people that have kind of been against the race scene again it's probably a reminder of like you know just how important these things are for young people man like a safe haven i can just imagine nowadays it's easier for me because i'm older and i have this more disposable income i can essentially go and get that kind of feeling somewhere else right i fly to berlin fly to amsterdam fly to barcelona fly to madrid and stuff and have a good time go to you know go to georgia right i could i could do that but if you're young if you're a younger person you don't have that kind of disposable income and you want to just you know meet cool people in your local city in your small town that you live in this is the only way you're going to do it by these by attending these legal raids and the more the more kind of strain they put on clubs which is weird because they want to dissuade kids from going to clubs to get drunk and get high and have fun but then they're pushing them more in the direction of these illegal raves and these legal raves for the most part are run by great people honestly everyone i've been to i've had no problem people that spoke about here seem pretty legit but there is also the there is also the option the kind of potential of kind of you know manev- bad things happening right and you know what how this government is right you know how shit we are with things like it always takes us one incident suddenly the whole thing is over so i hope Kids are inspired to do these events, put on their own, but also are inspired to look after each other, innit? That's the main thing, I think, with scenes and DJ sports. I remember I mentioned somebody when I went to Fold for the first time. I was blown away how amazing Fold was. I remember saying to somebody drunkenly in the toilet sometime, like, we really need to look after each other in this space. We need to make sure that they have no incidents, right? Especially, like, severe incidents of, like, drug overdoses, all those kind of things, right? Look after everyone because the moment something bad happens in here, we're all going to be kind of punished, by the government right they're going to take us a chance to kind of shut it down and teach us all our lessons so yeah it's a great article um great scene um blooming there and good, good to see kind of the kids kind of going out and kind of making something happen for themselves right not kind of bemoaning what's happening and complaining but actually making a change for themselves anyway that's it there for the action of English episode number 280 i think is it 280 or 281 i think 281 if you're listening via the podcast app as per usual um if you like the show give me a five star review share with your friends if you're watching via the youtube app of course smash that like button hit subscribe leave a comment down below and if you want more information regarding myself you know follow me on instagram xnozinga.com follow me on twitter xnozinga.com and check out my website xnozinga.com for more information regarding myself um links you can find them in the show notes description i'll put all the links to the articles down below You'll find that down below in the show notes description if you're watching via the pod. If you're listening via the podcast, I'll be finding it in the description. Click it and see it in there. If you're watching via YouTube, you'll see it in the box down below. Click that as well. You can read that. And then I'll see you guys again on the other side. For now, take care. Bye. Peace. Sayonara.